I'm good. Uh, let's just start with the basic stuff. Um, cool. When did you pick up the guitar or whatever instrument you picked up first? Um, I actually I started with bass guitar uh, back in 2002. Um, and I did that for about a year, um, essentially because I thought that guitar would be too hard, you know, uh, um, bass only four strings rather than six. So, uh, seemed a little less intimidating. Um, so that lasted for probably about a year and then I switched to guitar and, you know, everything is, uh, it's kind of been my obsession ever since. So. Uh, sick. Uh, what was the first guitar you got? First guitar I got, um, what was it? Oh, it was like one of those uh, little like Epiphone Les Paul Jr. things. Um, yeah. They're like totally flat. And uh, yeah, I think it's like made out of plywood or something like that. It's like a hundred bucks. Um, yeah, that was my uh, that was my first one. So nice. Yeah. Yeah, we all got to whether it's crappy or not, we all got to start with something just to learn. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I would definitely recommend that somebody buys like a you know, a hundred dollar guitar or something like that just to uh, start out with rather than dropping, you know, a grand or whatever. Yeah, because you never know. You might not might not be your thing, but I think there's nothing yeah. wrong with buying a nice guitar if you're really dedicated because then you're just going to grow into it. Sure, yeah. If, if, you're super, if you're super into the instrument, get a nice guitar. And uh, on that note, what was your first, like, good guitar, your first quality guitar? Uh, my first good one was a, it was a Gibson Les Paul Studio. Um, I think I bought it at Guitar Center for like 800 bucks or something like that. Um, it was pretty cool. I kind of wish that I still had that guitar. Unfortunately, I traded it for a, uh, a Jackson Randy Rose model. Um, so, you know, which is a, a great, it was like an RR5 that I traded it for, which is a Japanese made um jackson rose which is an awesome guitar but uh still kind of wish that i had that old les paul uh, yeah um yeah so they're, they're cool i really like les pauls uh, i think i'm you know my one of my early early influences are is randy rhodes so you know pretty much any guitar that he played i'm super into so yeah yeah feeling on that and um so i see that you play um in Silvertown, at least, uh, Jackson's and Charvel's. Was it was it Randy that made you want to pick up the Jackson Rhodes? Because I see you rock the King V. Yeah, I um, I mean, I think that I think I really wanted a a Flying V for a long time, um, you know, because of guys like Randy and um, I was super into uh, a band from Sweden called Dissection, and the guitar player of that band is pretty well known for playing a um like a white Gibson Flying V, uh, which he kind of got the idea from the dudes in Accept who had the two white Gibson Flying Vs. Um, so I really wanted like a, you know, like a white Flying V. Um, so I saw the uh, the Jackson Silver Elite guitar that I have and um, pretty much had to buy that. And uh, that, was, that was why I went with that one. And uh, yeah, I mean... Jackson, they just have like really, you know, really, really nice, comfortable necks with the compound radius. So it's, you know, it gets flatter as you get up here and it's uh, a little bit more rounded up here. So you can kind of chord easier and, and that kind of stuff. So for me, that has been something that um, getting that guitar and kind of spending as much time with it as I have, uh, that's something that's really comfortable to me. So any guitar that doesn't have that compound radius on it is kind of um feels weird to play so um yeah yeah that's nice and um are all your guitars jackson and the charvels because i see about that um that charvel with the i think it's a snakeskin design on it which looks oh yeah cool. yeah thanks man uh, um yeah that's a uh that was like a a project that i sort of put together it was a um it's like a white Jackson dinky that I found at a guitar center that was all dinged up and stuff like that. Um, you know, kind of like mine as happens, but uh, it had like a huge gouge in it, like down here. Um, so I, uh, got the genius idea to cover it in snakeskin Tolex. Uh, so I did that 
and the uh, the neck was from a, an 86 Charvel Model 3 or something like that, I think. So I had that neck put on that body. Um, so, yeah, almost kind of like a blending of the two, old and new. Yeah, because I was like, I've never seen a finish like that on a guitar. I was like, that must be a custom project you did because that was a, just a crazy finish on it. Yeah, I got the idea from um, Warren Martini from Rat, who has a pretty famous um charvel that's covered in like real legitimate snakeskin um yeah uh so i i didn't want to go with the real snakeskin route because i mean you know let's face it it, it's probably better um, (laughs) so yeah plus the uh the tolex is just it's dirt cheap so you can get it and uh you know if you screw up for whatever big deal yeah and um, so speaking of gear, uh, so you use the Jackson Charvels. Uh, what kind of amps and uh, pedals do you like to run? Um, I have a lot of different pedals that I'm using. Um, I think the most basic uh, setup that I have is I do a um, I do basically guitar into. I have like a Dunlop wah that I use. Um, I use a mxr phase like a a mini one it's supposed to be like a phase 90 meets like a phase whatever um and then i have a uh an overdrive pedal by khdk which is kirk hammett's um pedal company and that is a uh a ghoul jr um i really like the little mini pedals they're so nice to just cram onto your board um and that thing just sounds completely awesome um it's basically like a like a tube screamer or like an old 808 kind of thing. Um, but they got a couple switches and stuff on there that let you um, kind of dial in the sound a little bit more, make it a little bit more aggressive. Um, that pedal's awesome. Um, and then from there, I go into a, uh, I have a, a compression pedal, an MXR compression that I use for cleans. Um, and then a, a Boss chorus pedal, one of the CE2s, uh, the Wazzlecraft reissue. Um, the CE2 is an awesome, awesome uh, chorus pedal. I like it. It's very, very subtle. Um, and uh, Chris Oliva from Sabotage was pretty famous for using that. So um, really like his kind of chorusy tones. Yeah. Um, and then in my uh, in my loop, I have basically just have like a harmonizer pedal because on some of my solos, I like to sort of harmonize some of the lead lines and that can get kind of difficult to do live um i just kick on that little harmonizer pedal and takes care of that for me um and then i have a uh, an eq that i use for a boost just kind of give me a little bit more mid-range for solos and then delay which is a um a dunlop echoplex unit uh one of the little pedal ones that they just reissued and um then that goes into a little mini spring reverb for just a little touch of reverb um which is a a wampler uh spring reverb the mini one that's uh my wife got me for christmas so that's uh that's the newest edition and then um as far as amps go i am using i bought this uh pv 6534 back in like god i don't know like 2014 or something like that i've been using it ever since so it's uh it's one of the old ones that are made in the USA, which is pretty pretty cool, pretty special because they don't make them here anymore. Um, in fact, I don't even think you can buy the the EL34 version of the 6505, um, which is you know the PV version of the 5150. So it's a 5150 with EL34s essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with the 6505, what made you choose that over like? The other famous metal amps like a like an angle or a marshall or something like that um i think probably because when when i started getting into the whole amp game uh the 5150 slash 6505 was probably just the most affordable one that i could find um and i think that that's still the case i mean you could find a old 5150 used for like 600 bucks so it's kind of a you know it's kind of a no-brainer when everything else is like a a grand or more um 
And yeah, I mean, it, it had just been used on so many albums that I love um, that uh, it was kind of just something that uh, I was I was drawn to. So I'm pretty much hooked now on the whole um, 5150 train. Yeah, I got the, the 20 watt 6505 head. And I oh, think nice. Brushes. It's, it, I think they're compared to all the metal, other metal amps out there. They're just so tight and yeah. very active, and they don't have the greatest. When it comes to cleans, as long as you throw on like a chorus and delay, it sounds good. But yeah, yeah, the clean yeah. it leaves it leaves a little bit to be desired. There are some tricks, you know, to to make that clean sound a little bit more you know, shimmery and stuff like that, and a little more clean, I guess, if you will. Um, one of which I found is using, like, a, I like to uh, run cleans with this. Um, my neck pickup on this one is a uh, single coil, so if you can get kind of a nice low output single coil, uh, low output pickup single coil, preferably, into that clean channel with a little bit of compression, some chorus, and some delay, like you said, and yeah, it can it can sound okay. It's not going to be like a, you know, a Fender clean or whatever, but, you know, it's passable. Yeah, for it does, at least for metal clean, so. Yeah. The only thing you really care about is the distortion, so. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, and um, what kind of guitar are you holding there? I see it's a Jackson, but uh, what kind of model is that? Uh, this, this, is a, this is a really weird Jackson. Um, my wife found this at her work. Uh, she works at a thrift store in Portland, so occasionally they have some guitars and stuff like that come in there. So this thing came in, and it was, you know, it was badly beaten up. I think if I get it close, you can kind of see that there's a bunch of chips and stuff like that in the headstock. Um, and then some additional chips that I've sort of put in to it because I'm a clumsy oaf. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't really know what kind of model it is. Um, I do know that it's made in Japan because when I pulled, you know, the parts that were on it off, um, they're all marked made in Japan. So uh, fairly certain it's made in Japan. I think it's probably like an early 90s Jackson, like 93 or something like that. And my best guess is that they were, for a little while back in the early 90s, they did this... Um, they did a version of Japanese-made Jacksons, which were kind of like a little bit more budget, um, and they were called the Jackson Concept Line. Um, before they came out and they branded them all Concept, they did kind of a weird, like, concept prototype for a year just to kind of try it out. Um, and I think that this is one of those um, because it's, it's very much like the... Uh, the other Jackson concepts that came out, but there's a couple differences and a couple things that they improved. Um, and then the concept series eventually was shipped over to Korea and they renamed that um, performer series. So uh, it's, it's weird. It's a very weird guitar, but yeah, it came into her work and it was badly beaten up and, you know, somebody had some like weird bridge on it, some kind of like, uh, like an old school traditional sort of fender bridge that they just, you know, really kind of like crappily screwed into place. Um, the wiring was shot, you know, there was basically like no hardware. Uh, so I basically just took it and, oh yeah, and somebody put a um, kind of like a rattle can, like Eddie Van Halen um, sort of stripe pattern in like these really weird, like different shades of gray. Uh, so it was, it was rough, man. Um, so I stripped all that stuff off and, uh yeah had a buddy paint it in this kind of green crackle color as you can see yeah it's a uh, yeah thank you um and uh yeah just kind of replaced everything put some emgs in it but, uh i had a drilled for a, a, uh, an original floyd um and i got this dumb little light up kill switch sort of thing that's sick. and yep. uh yeah that's about that. So, are you endorsed by Jackson? I'm not. I'm not sure because I've been following you on Instagram. I know you're endorsed by EMG. Do you have any professional relations with Jackson guitars? Um, I do have uh, have some relations. It's kind of 
you know, they're they're a little bit informal over there as far as like the the roster and stuff like that goes. Um, I mean, you have some some like big name guys who are like, of course, like on the roster and they're doing, you know, their kind of uh, like signature models and stuff like that, um, such as like, you know, uh, Chris Broderick and you know, Misha Mansoor and uh, Jeff Loomis now. Um, and then you have some other people who are kind of like, you know, we sort of talk and, uh, you know, we get we have a relationship that's sort of like beneficial where, you know, they'll kind of throw us some, some free guitars or something like that. Like, Hey, here's a new, you know, whatever, um, you know, take it and use it on tour or use it on your album, what have you. Um, and just kind of share that for your, your following and stuff like that. So it's kind of, they're, they're kind of informal over there, which I don't know, you might not necessarily expect in that they're, you know, owned by Fender. You would think it's all, corporate and there's a lot of contracts being thrown around um but not necessarily like that with jackson but um yeah i mean i know those guys and you know they're all cool great people and uh yeah yeah i love jackson with sick guitars and uh speaking of you mentioned jeff loomis on uh the new silver talent album um you did the cover of battle battle angels by sanctuary and you had jeff loomis come in and do the solo for it yeah how did um how were you able to contact Jeff Loomis and getting him to do a solo? Did you already know him prior to doing it or? Yeah. Um, yeah, I did. I, I met Jeff um, probably a couple of years ago uh, at a, uh, there's a band from Seattle called Fifth Angel. Um, they're like an old eighties band. Um, <clears throat> and so they recently got back together, um, you know, I say recently, like, you know, within the past, like, five years or something like that. Um, and they uh, they were playing a show up in, in Seattle at a place called El Corazon. So, um, you know, I live in Portland, which is, you know, three hours or something like that south of Seattle. So uh, I was pretty much just like, oh, man, these guys are back. I got to go see it. So I uh, drove up there with my wife and... Um, you know, I'm walking into the venue and, you know, there's Jeff just hanging out outside of the building. Um, and so I'm like, oh, wow, Jeff Loomis. So uh, I go up and I'm like, hey, I got to I gotta get a picture with you, man. Uh, you know, just being a total like little fanboy, um, which is a little embarrassing. But, you know, you do what you got to do. We all do it. Um, and oddly enough, he was like, hey, man, I, I think I know you. And I'm like, Phew no you don't i'm like okay here here comes somebody that's gonna say that i look like dave mustaine like uh you know so many other people do um and uh you know surprisingly he actually did he had like seen me on instagram and stuff he's like oh you're from portland and you you play a jackson right and i'm like yeah he's like oh man killer guitar playing and i'm like oh thanks so uh you know after that we kind of just stayed in touch and um yeah, so that was cool. So, yeah, we talk uh, fairly regularly, and um, I got the idea to uh, do the, the Sanctuary cover because when we released our first demo, Devil Machine, earlier last year, um, a lot of people were kind of comparing it to Sanctuary a little bit, so um, I thought, you know, let's do a Sanctuary cover, and... Um, and I thought, you know, Jeff obviously has a very long history with Worrell, and, you know, he was in Sanctuary for a little bit, and, uh, you know, Nevermore would do that song back in the 90s. So um, I asked him, and surprisingly, yeah, he was he was into it. So, yeah, he laid down that solo, and uh, it, was, it was cool. It made all my little um, fanboy dreams kind of come true, you know? Yeah, I know when I've, uh, back in, like, the summer, or whenever Devil Machine came out, that's what I instantly thought. I was like, this sounds like, obviously, it sounded a bit, um, tuning-wise, heavier and lower, but I was like, yeah, this sounds like, like, Sanctuary. I thought it was sick. Yeah, hell yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, uh, Sanctuary is definitely a huge influence to, uh, you know, everything that we're doing, and, you know, Nevermore as well, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's sick, and, um... For EMG, how'd you uh, come across landing the endorsement with EMG? Um, I had a, um, actually the guy that painted this guitar, um, he has a little company in Portland called Black Chapel Guitars. He's just making um, kind of custom, custom build stuff. 
And uh, he had started this guitar company, I want to say, back in what, 2015 or 2016 or something like that. So um, one of the, the first companies that he sort of got on board to distribute to him uh, was EMG. Um, so I had been using EMGs in my Silver King V for a while and, you know, absolutely loved them. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I just told him, like, hey, you know, if you have any contacts over there, I would love to, you know, get hooked up with those guys at EMG and see if I can't work out some sort of deal or something like that. So, um, yeah, he got me some contact information, and that was pretty much it. So. Yeah, sick. And I, I see now people on Instagram like me that just – post their covers and their originals like i've seen people with what 600 followers getting emg endorsements yeah it's you know they're they're definitely paying attention to uh a lot of the the social media kind of guitarists and and stuff like that which i think is is pretty cool and it's good on them um because you know you got these people that are out there who are uh doing their thing and you know they're they're going to be repping the name so yeah, it's good to good to jump on that. I think it's awesome that they recognize that. And um, with EMG, what was it that um that made you first want to use them with the actives compared to like a passive Seymour Duncan? Um, I mean, I think I think that it was just you know I was really into um the guitar tones that I was hearing that uh, I knew people were playing actives with, um, such as like Andy James. Uh, he has a really great solid uh kind of liquidy sounding lead tone um and then like uh you know jeff loomis again he was using emgs a lot back in the day and still uses a lot of active pickups um and uh michael romeo was another big one he was a big emg guy uh back in the day and uh yeah just really really like those tones really like the lead sounds so i thought you know um Oh, and one other thing is I tried uh, Sebastian, the other guitar player in Silver Talon. He had recently just gotten a, um, uh, at the time, this is a few years ago, he just gotten a, uh, a King V Pro, um, I believe, that had the 8160 set in it. And uh, that was kind of my first time, you know, really sitting down and trying um, to, to uh, play some, some EMG-equipped guitars. And... Uh, yeah, from there I was kind of like, oh, okay, I get it. Uh, you know, everything is is right, and uh, it just has like a a certain amount of compression, I think, that really sort of helps, um, and it it just makes dialing in like a solid lead tone that much easier. Mm-hmm. Now, like uh, when you get, say, you get a guitar that comes with like something like a Duncan or a Demarzio that's passive, do you? Do you enjoy the sound of the pickups, or do you just instantly put EMG in there? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I I will I like that sound. I mean, the passive sound is is cool. Uh, I mean, it sounds good. But I think for you know what I feel comfortable with, and you know what I like, uh, definitely actives are uh, a little bit more suited for that. Yeah, I think especially when you're using uh, lower tunings, the actives definitely um, keep your tone a bit tight and make it more clear and not as muddy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the clarity is is a huge thing for uh, for all of that. Like, it makes everything, you know, especially like leads and stuff like that. It, it just makes them so much more clear. The the note definition is um, it can kind of be uh, scary sometimes. It's it's so clear, but uh, you know, in the end, when you're when you're able to really nail a certain passage or whatever it it i think it really shows and with uh with silver talent um are you guys in the because i know you just a few months ago released uh the becoming demon album are you in the process of writing new music for another single or album yeah i am um we recently got signed to m theory audio so we have a record label now so i'm in the process of working on putting together a full album so uh, about let's say i'm about four songs into it so that's about you know 50 percent given the fact that most of the songs that i write are like four and a half to five minutes or or what have you so um yeah we're about halfway done with that so hopefully we can um get some studio time booked this summer and 
just kind of start laying all that stuff down. And um, for uh, for tunings for writing, I know um, on songs like Devil Machine, you use drop C. Uh, do you usually is that like your standard, or do you switch around with other tunings? Uh, usually it's drop C or D standard. Um, <clears throat> so and it all just kind of depends um, where I'm at as far as you know what's going to uh, inspire me, I guess, to come up with the best song. Um, you know, sometimes I'll try to write something and it'll just be in D standard or whatever. And, uh, you know, I'll be like, oh, man, I just I wish I had like a, an extra note that I could use. So, um, you know, doing doing drop C is cool because it gives you two extra notes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it really all depends, you know, it really all depends on the song. Um, I mean, as far as like, you know, there are some bands that get really crazy with tunings and stuff like that. And they, uh, you know, have songs that are in, you know, every song is kind of like a different tuning. Um, that sort of thing is not necessarily something that uh, I want to do just because, you know, logistics. I mean, you have to have different guitars for different tunings and stuff like that. So I already have to bring like three different guitars on the road. So if I had uh, more tunings, the number of guitars would kind of skyrocket. So. Yeah, and especially with using a, like a Floyd Rose bridge, you can't just change the tuning on on the fly. You gotta kind of keep it locked. In. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, you have to. And uh, I mean, even if you're using like a fixed bridge or whatever, if you're if you're vastly changing the the tension on the guitar, I mean, the you know it's made out of wood, so it's gonna kind of it's gonna react. There's gonna be different um, you know different pounds of pressure that are on the neck, so you know you might tune down a little bit or something or tune up somewhere else and it might kind of send that whole thing a little bit out of control so you know like i've seen um some local bands that'll have a bunch of different tunings and they'll be using one song and they'll be tuning in between the uh the songs for you know getting ready for the next one and it just it, it, the whole thing goes out of tune like you know halfway through the song or whatever so and uh, have you ever tried those um I think it's a EVH detuner or something like that where you uh, yeah have... I got oh, one here nice yeah yeah those are cool if you have a um if you have a Floyd Rose that uh, I mean as you can see like this one it doesn't go back it's not recessed or anything like that so yeah if you uh, if you have one that um, kind of stays flat it doesn't go up or anything uh, the detuner is it's great. It definitely makes tuning and, and down tuning and stuff like that. Uh, at least going from like D to drop C, it's it's so much easier. So that's why when I go to practice, I'll 90% of the time I'll bring this one just because uh, I only need to bring one guitar to play through our whole set. So yeah, does it does it work that well? Because I got a I have like a Dean Dimebag guitar with a Floyd. And I've been wanting to get one on it forever because it's my only guitar with a Floyd. And um, but I've been kind of skeptical about how well it actually drops the string yeah i mean it it certainly works um the only thing that i would tell you to watch out for is like if if it is a recessed floyd um then you know you're you're gonna have to watch out because a lot of times they uh they set the neck angle a little bit differently so you don't have say as much clearance between the um the floyd rose and the actual body so and of course they do that little cutout thing, right? You know, yeah. around the uh, around the, the string lock screws or whatever. Um, so you might not have a whole lot of room there to uh, you know put a thing that's kind of sticking out or whatever on there. Um, but uh, yeah, and you know if that's the case, another trick that you can use because I mean essentially the way that this works is it's it's just like a you know. They have found like the perfect space or whatever that's going to drop the string um, by a full step, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know when you look at these tuners, you know you push it down and the pitch goes higher. You let it out, the pitch goes lower. Um, so that's basically all that deep tuner is doing is you pull it out and it's basically like undoing your fine tuner thing um, by enough to get you to, uh, you know. A step lower right yeah um so another thing that you could do 
is if you wanted to, um, you know, block your bridge so it only goes down, right? Um, no going up because if it's floating and you're trying to change tunings, that's that's a, a losing battle completely. Yeah. Um, so what you do is basically you just uh, block it, only goes down, and then take this fine tuner screw and just kind of screw it, you know, close to all the way in. Uh, tune it to like you know, E standard or whatever, lock it in place. And then you can basically use this and you should have enough room to be able to drop by a step by just twisting this thing and pulling it out. So. Yeah, so, uh, sounds really cool. Yeah. I mean, um, you could do the same thing without the D-tuna. It just, the D-tuna just makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. And uh, one of the last things I wanted to cover, uh, what do you think um, about the quote-unquote modern metal scene today because it's very at least with silvertown it's you guys sound a lot different than the the normal modern metal band with like seven and eight string guitars tuning super low mm -hmm. yeah i mean i don't know that stuff it's it's cool um you know i was kind of kind of came up on you know like uh punk and old school metal and, and stuff like that so that's kind of it's kind of where my, my background is, my history is, I guess, um, a little more, uh, you know, I don't want to say like traditional because I'm, I'm definitely not trying to limit myself in, 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 you know, what I can and can't write, but yeah, um, definitely not so interested, I guess, in just the, uh, the super chugga chugga kind of genty stuff, I guess, if you will. I mean, even though that, you know, that stuff's cool. But it's just maybe not something that inspires me. Um, and so, you know, I do think that there are a lot more bands out there these days that are kind of doing more of a, an old school thing. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, you know, in the, the sort of like sub genre vacation of, of metal, I guess, um, you know, the old school thing is definitely becoming more and more of a, of a sub genre. Um, so that's that's something that's definitely interesting, but and um with uh writing for Silvertown at least, um when you go in when you lay down some riffs and try and write a song, do you will you write a song like uh say based if you've been listening to a song from your favorite band a lot and you're really inspired by that one song, mm -hmm. like will you write similar to how bands will and just add your own modifications or is it just total blank slate? Um, I mean, I think it's easier if you don't start with a blank slate, if if that makes sense. Um, because it's like, you know, like in college when I was, you know, writing essays and stuff like that, like the, the worst part of it is just this open, you know, word or whatever. And you just have that blank page staring at you and you're like, oh, my God, how do I fill this? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, there there really is a, a myriad of music out there and um there are ways to become inspired by that music and to, you know, I guess take inspiration from that without necessarily being a carbon copy and being like super derivative of, you know, whatever you're listening to or whatever's inspiring you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll try to do that. Uh, if there's, you know, if I'm listening to a song, I'm like, oh, man, this is cool. Uh, maybe I should try to, you know, write something like this. Um, you know, I'll give it a go and then whatever happens, happens. Um, you know, definitely not trying to, I guess, break it down like uh, riff by riff or whatever. Like, you know, let's try to just play this riff backward or whatever because it's like this and this other song that I really like. Um, you know, not necessarily like that, but, you know. You could take little bits of, of things um, that inspire you from from all over from places. And, you know, if you kind of blend it together, then, you know, all of a sudden, um, you know, this stuff that might have been derivative, if you're just looking at like one piece or like one song, um, you start throwing other songs in there, uh, then it becomes original. So, yeah, I think that's perfect. I think it was like... Um... I think like Phil Anselmo said the same thing, like rip off like five to ten of your favorite bands and then you get your own sound. And then that's. Best. Yeah. Totally. Oh, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say, yeah, totally. I mean, you know, it's it's also very uh, 
it's also a very you thing to, you know, take different parts of things that you like um, because, you know, the next guy is maybe not going to take the same things from those 10 bands. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's perfect. Well, um, uh, thanks for joining me, man.